if you do want to get in touch with me, uh, I'll take as many questions as I can uh, at the end of the presentation, but if I can't get around to you or I don't get a chance to talk to you, you can contact me through any of these details. Okay, uh, Nick Carr wrote a book there a while back called The Big Switch. And the idea behind The Big Switch was that the internet companies have to become more like utilities. Great idea, he's absolutely right, but we're taking that idea and we're turning it on its head in this presentation and we're saying now that the utility companies are going to have to become more like the internet and they're going to have to embrace core web tool principles to move forward and survive in this new uh, data enabled era that Dio Hinchcliffe referred to this morning. This is Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. This is him with one of his first telephones. If you were to put Alexander Graham Bell in front of <laughs> any of these babies today, these smartphones, he'd be scratching his head, wouldn't have a clue what to do with them. This is Thomas Edison, famous for the invention of the light bulb amongst other things but also inventor of the electrical grid, the distribution mechanism for electricity globally. If you were to put Thomas Edison in front of today's electricity grid, he'd recognize it instantly because it hasn't changed a jot since he invented it. There has been almost no investment in technologies in grids in the last 100 years. They're exactly the same now, virtually exactly the same now as they were when he first came up with them. Electricity 1.0 has got lots of problems. It's read-only. In other words, you can only, in, in most cases, there's one or two exceptions, but in most cases, you can only consume. It's top-down. It's highly regulated. There is reams and reams of legislation in every country around electricity production, and there are massive barriers to change as a result. Electrical grids are like lands. There are over 500 grids in the US alone. There are hundreds of them here in the EU, in Europe, across Asia. The vast majority of them are not interconnected. They're isolated lands. So, for instance, if you look at the US example, you can have states in the US with grids where the wind is blowing, they have massive excesses of energy, and states or counties alongside them with massive peaks in demand and no way for the two to share electricity. It's a ridiculous, ridiculous mechanism. It's buggy. You've seen massive rolling blackouts and obvious brownouts uh, all the time. Uh, you had the big example of the, the, the northeastern states in the US a couple of years back when the whole place went down for almost three days. Grids are dumb. <laughs> They're unbelievably dumb. They're dumb like you wouldn't believe, seriously. If there's an outage in an area, an, el an electrical outage in an area, say for instance, a tree falls, takes down a line, storm knocks over a line, a digger digs up a line, a whole area gets taken out. The first that the electricity company knows about it is when the phones start ringing with people saying, why have I got no electricity? There's no reporting back from the grid to the electrical company. That's how dumb grids are. They're closed. It's incredibly difficult to get on to be a producer in an electrical setup, an electrical uh, uh, grid. It's, it's very hard to, to, to put energy into the system. It's closed. It's a closed system. You can't get in. They're architected for the past, and this goes back to what I said about uh, Edison's, Edison's recognizing them. What I mean by that is, Electricity grids are built for uh, times when well, they're, they're, they're a system that are designed for uh, variable but predictable demand and controllable supply. 
So you ramp up supply as you expect demand to ramp up, you ramp down supply as you expect demand to ramp down. So you predict ahead of time, based on previous patterns, what the supply and demand curves are going to be. You know, if you look at the weather forecast, if it's going to be hot, the air conditioners will be coming on at this time, therefore you plan ahead of time to turn on extra power plants at these times. That's the old way, and that's going to have to change. And the reason it's going to have to change is because we're going to be get, coming into a situation where we have to get more renewables onto the grid, and renewables are a variable source. So wind blows more, you get more supply coming onto the grid. And suddenly, your, your system, which was nice and controlled before and balanced, is now being thrown out because the supply side is starting to go up and down enormously and you start to get instabilities on the grid. So you have to try and balance the grid to make it more stable so that you can bring in more renewables. And we'll talk a little more about that. It's provisioning for hits. In other words, uh, and the reason we have the kettle up here is that there's, a, there's the typical spike in the UK, uh, which is, uh, I think, Coronation Street is the, the, the big soap opera series or East Enders that bomb from like 7 to 7.30 in the evening. At break times or when that ends, everyone gets up, sticks on the kettle, and suddenly there's a massive spike in demand for electricity that the grid management companies predict ahead of time and provision for. Hugely, hugely inefficient. I was talking to Martin Buer uh, from Amazon Web Services yesterday, <coughs> and just talking to him reminded me of a presentation that Mike Culver, one of their evangelists, gave in Cork uh, last year. And he used this slide, and I think it's a brilliant slide. It's a slide uh, which shows the traffic graph for the website of the Australian Open. And you can see the Australian Open very obviously happens every year, 2006, 2007, 2008, around January. And you get a massive spike in interest. And therefore, this is the, this is the, 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 the absolute reason why you want to be using cloud computing, because you don't want to be provisioning for that, the top of that spike. You don't want to have those servers sitting idle for 11 months of the year. So cloud computing is massively efficient. The same thing goes uh, for, for grids. Grids have to provision for hits like that. But there, there are better ways of doing it, and this is what we're going to come to. There are a lot of oh no's out there. Oh no, the price of crude oil is going up. It's coming back down a bit now, but I think the, the downward trend at the moment is because of a recession. That's a short-term downward movement. Demand has gone down, so price is going down. If you look from 1999 to 2008 on that graph, you can see the overall trend is upwards, despite a few drops in the middle. Right now we're in the middle of another drop in the middle again. It's going to trend upwards all the way. Energy prices are going up. And then comes along, then along comes renewable energy, the bad boy, in the minds of the utilities. Utilities hate renewables. They particularly hate wind, uh, and that's, that's a problem because wind energy right now is the only economically viable renewable. Solar is getting better, it's becoming more, more efficient, uh, it, it's starting to become more economically viable, but even still right now, wind is the most economically viable one. It's variable, it causes the grid management companies all kinds of problems, as I was outlining there, with the, the instability of its supply. So they can't control the supply, so it causes them massive problems. So this is, it's, for, for, for utility companies, wind energy is the real bogeyman.